Allahumma Rabbi Yassir Wa la tu'assir Wa tammin bil khair Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Subhanaka La ilma lana Illa ma'alamtana Innaka anta al-alimul hakim Sadaqallah Sadaqallah al-aliyul azim Wa sadaqa rasulahun nabiyul kareem Wa nahnu ala thalika min al-shahideen Amma ba'd <coughs> Alhamdulillah All praises and thanks are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala For blessing us to be here today To perform the Salatul Jum'ah And to listen to the khutbah we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his peace and blessings onto the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his rahmah, his mercy upon each and every one of us. To shower his hidayah, his guidance upon us. To shower his forgiveness upon us and to shower his acceptance upon us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our salah, accept our coming here today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our supplications, our dua. And I again ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To shower his rahmah, his mercy upon me by giving me the permission and the ability to fulfill this responsibility in delivering the khutbah, inshallah. I seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance. I seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower unto me the quality of tawakkal Allah. The trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the taqwa, the piety, the iman, the faith, the hikmah, the wisdom, the ilm, the knowledge, and once more the ability to fulfill this responsibility in delivering the khutbah, insha'Allah. I put my tawakkal, I put my trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most sufficient. Alhamdulillah, last week, and bi with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, last week we reminded ourselves a little bit about the miraj, about Salah, that gift that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received on the night of Miraj. And we also reminded ourselves of some of the other lessons that were taught to us in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's experience on that night, on that ascension, that journey. We also touched a little bit last week on the aspect of when people have problems. When people, when we have problems and we stick to our faith in Allah, our tawakkal, our trust in Allah, and we try our best to keep Allah Sirat al Mustaqim on the right path and be constant and consistent in our duty to Allah. Because sometimes troubles and problems and difficulties are just a test. Most of the times, actually, it's a trial, it's a test. But if we keep firm, Allah Sirat al-Mustaqim on the path that Allah expects us to keep. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open so many doors and doors of bounties for us that is beyond our imagination, beyond our comprehension and understanding. But you see, we can't just think, well, we have problems. And it's Allah's duty to fix our problems. Of course, by the rahmah of Allah and the mercy of Allah, Allah does everything for us by his mercy. But sometimes he wants to test us. He wants to check us out. See if we will stop praying or we'll pray more. We have some problems. Would we pray more? Would we stop praying? Would we turn to drugs and alcohol? Thinking that drugs and alcohol will solve our problems? Or drugs and alcohol would be the solution to our problems? Or would we keep on the straight path, doing our duty to Allah, praying our salah, giving charity, fasting, going to perform hajj? Because problems are not always money. Problems can be many things. People can have many problems in life. Money may just be one issue. But if we keep on that path, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised, as we have seen in the example of the Miraj, and you know this is the month of Rajab, and it is on the 27th, 27th night of Rajab, that the Prophet sallallahu ascended to the heavens, for Masjid al-Aqsa, he went to, I mean, for Masjid al-Haram, the Kaaba, to Masjid al-Aqsa. And then he ascended by the Qudrat, the power, the mercy of Allah. We already reminded ourselves on that verse, chapter 17, verse 1, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Subhanallah, the asra bi abdihi laylam min al-Masjid al-Haram ila al-Masjid al-Aqsa. Allah says, glory be to Allah who has taken his servant by night from Masjid al-Haram, by the Kaaba, to Masjid al-Aqsa. Alladhi barakna hawlahu linuriyahu min ayatina. Innahu huwa samiul basir. So that he will see the blessed surroundings. Again, those of us who were here last week, and I'm, I just want to remind Myself and you have one or two points before we continue, inshallah. You remember that we reminded ourselves that before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on this mission, this physical, spiritual, scientific mission, elevation, the muhaddithin, the commentators of hadith and the mufassirin, the commentators of Quran, they all unanimously agree that two very interesting things happened before that, in that very same year, within that same year, before the Prophet ﷺ went on this unique journey. The passing away of his uncle, Abu Talib, who was of a great help and assistant to him because of the persecution and the oppression that he was facing with all those people around him and the disbelievers who were oppressing him. And he, his, his wife, Hazrat Khadija, radiallahu ta'ala, she also passed away, who was on the other hand a great help to him financially, morally, spiritually, in all different ways she helped him. She was of a great pillar and support to him. And with all this persecution and oppression, she passed away. The uncle passed away. Allahu Akbar. So as we said last week, sometimes when one door is closed, Allah opens many doors, right? But here, it was not about only doors being opened. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened the heavens for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's chapter 17 verse 1. Allah tells us this is not a regular story or any unauthentic kahani. 
Allah says, Glory be to him, Allah, subhanallah, the asra bi abdihi laylam min al masjid al haram min al masjid al aqsa. Allah says that we should glorify Allah because it was by the kudrat and power of Allah that Allah took him from Makkah to Jerusalem with the Burak. And the Prophet says that Jibreel wasalam, tied the Burak there. And then he ascended through the heavens. So Allah opened the heavens for him while he was being oppressed and persecuted and all these problems down here on earth. Not only ten doors were open, but the heavens were open for him. The angel came and took him on this unique journey. So today, so those of us who were not here actually last week, you can get that CD from the Al-Hikmat Dawah table. As we always say, the CDs are free. Take it, distribute it, remind ourselves. You can do a, put a donation in Al-Hikmat Dawah box so we can do more CDs to distribute. Today happens to be the 14th of April, right? And what's the next thing we know today as? Good Friday. Very interesting, huh? Good Friday. Now, I know some of you probably wondering, well, what does Good Friday has to do with Muslims? What does Good Friday has to do with Muslims? Well, the Christians commemorate Good Friday. And interesting enough, Good Friday is something, a day, actually, that is very unique for Muslims also. Because Good Friday is about Isa, alayhi salatu wa salam. Good Friday is about Jesus, peace be upon him. And yes, while the Christians believe, and I mean, we have, we agree to disagree on the differences of opinion with Judaism and Christianity, and that's the beauty about Islam. You know, last night I went to church up the street here, the Lutheran church. You know, we go to all the churches, we talk in the churches and the synagogues, etc. So it's not about criticizing anyone. It's, they know, they ask me questions. I said, that's our difference. We accept the miraculous birth of Jesus, peace be upon him. We, as Muslims and Islam, accept the fact that Maryam, alayhi salatu wasalam, gave birth to Jesus, peace be upon him. Maryam, the virgin, Mary. The Quran speaks of her in chapter 19. So the Quran speaks about her, the Virgin Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, peace be upon him. So we accept his birth, and I tell the Christians that all the time when we are in interfaith discussions. But the only thing is that we don't accept their concept that he died. So that's just it. And you would have heard in previous lectures and khutbahs that we have reminded ourselves that the Jews did not accept the birth of Jesus. They did not believe in the miraculous birth. They did not believe in the Virgin Mary giving birth to Jesus, peace be upon him. They thought it was just a hoax. It was just not real. That's why they never accepted Isa, salatu wasalam, or Jesus, peace be upon him. They never accepted him as a prophet and as the Messiah. So they did not accept his miraculous birth and him being the prophet of God. That's why the whole nine yards about the Romans and the crucifixion came around, which connects to today. But we Muslims accepted his miraculous birth. We don't accept that he died. The point I'm getting at, my brothers and sisters, and we have gone down in details. I don't know if they got those CDs at the Dawah table, but you can go online and Google Al Hikmat TV or on Al Hikmat YouTube, and we did. We have a lot of uh, lectures on Jesus, peace be upon him, on the crucifixion, on Maryam alayhi salatu wasalam, the connection with us and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Islam with Jesus, peace be upon him, and Maryam. The point I'm getting at is a lot of us may think that what does Good Friday have to do with Muslims? But Good Friday has a lot to do with Muslims. Good Friday has a lot to do with Islam. Good Friday is a day that we can use the whole teachings 
in Islam, the teachings in Christianity, the teachings in Judaism, bring it together and remind our Jewish friends and Christian friends on the Islamic perspective. Oh, yeah. Because the Quran speaks about Jesus, peace be upon him. The Quran speaks about this day that they tried to crucify him, but they did not kill him, nor was he crucified. But Allah raised him. So Allah speaks of this incident. Actually, when we go to interfaith services in many a times, the questions of Jesus, peace be upon him, comes up. A lot of times people ask, well, okay, you speak so much, because Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, the Quran, chapter 3, verse 64, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ We Muslims are commanded by Allah in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, to call the Jews and Christians and discuss the areas, so I am baina now baina kum, the areas of commonalities between us and them. How we believe in Allah, the one God, who was Musa, Moses, peace be upon him, Ibrahim, Abraham, peace be upon him, Jesus, peace be upon him, his mother Maryam, alayhi salatu wasalam, Zachariah, the family of Ali Imran. You know, when you talk about Ali Imran, chapter 3, it speaks so much about the family of Jesus. Peace be upon him. Who is Ali Imran? See, a lot of us read the Quran. Ramadan is coming. We beat our heads with the Quran. But we have no clue what's going on. Who was the Ali Imran? Go check it out. You go into chapter 3 of Ali Imran. It's called the family of Imran. And you will see it all surrounded around Maryam alayhi salatu wasalam, Zakaria alayhi salatu wasalam, Jesus peace be upon him, Yahya alayhi salatu wasalam, the mother, the grandmother of Jesus, the mother of Jesus peace be upon him, the cousin of Jesus peace be upon him, the uncle of Jesus peace be upon him. But do we really read the Quran? This is not Bible, you know, this is Quran. Hence, I always remind myself and I remind you, my brothers and sisters, that if we would really contemplate on the message of the Quran, then we would be able to speak to our Christian friends and Christian associates and let them know the perspective of Islam and Christianity and Judaism and how we are one and we are one big faith and we came from the same origin, the same God, the same Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, the same families that the Quran speak about, but we just differ on certain issues. We have more in common than we have in differences. And this day, Good Friday, that the Christians call Good Friday, is one of the major days that creates that little difference. Because we all believe that the people wanted to kill Jesus, peace be upon him. The difference is that Christians believe that he died he was crucified, and on the Sunday, which is Easter Sunday, they call Easter Sunday, he rose from the grave. And we say, okay. We agree that the people wanted to kill him, but Allah says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4 of the Quran, they didn't kill him. Because when he said, oh, Father, why hast thou forsaken me now? Allah created that miracle. The clouds became dark. Strong winds and everybody disappeared. And they left Jesus, peace be upon him, there. And that's when that little miracle took place. When Allah made that reformation, as we would call. And when the people came back, they saw Jesus, the person on the cross, looking like it's Jesus. A lot of Islamic Fasidin and commentators say it was Judas that Allah made. Or it was somebody else that Allah made look like Jesus. So it would have just ended that story. Because there's a continuation to this story where Jesus, peace be upon him, will come back. And you know, Islamically, Allah, the Prophet says that Jesus will come back. Again in Surah Nisa, you go check the verses, chapter 4, 157, 158, 159. You know, I'm looking at the clock. We have no time to go in details. You'll see what Allah speaks about. They did not kill him. 
You also see where Allah speaks about in Surah Nisa, that the Jews and the Christians, the Ahl Kitab, and we have a lot of lectures we did on that, Alhamdulillah, Bezhnalat, Al Hikmat. I don't know if it's at the table, but you can ask the girls for it. That Allah says that before the mouth to he, before the death of Jesus, peace be upon him, the Jews and the Christians will come to the reality and will accept the true facts about Jesus, peace be upon him. Did he really die? When he was raised, his coming back. You see, this is very important to us. It's not just a day that goes by. This is an important lesson in the Quran and in Islam that if we Muslims would really do some pondering around the life of Jesus, peace be upon him, you will see so many commonalities and we may be able to sit and talk to Christians and Jews and show them the commonalities in the Bible and the Torah and the Psalms, the oneness. But we are so far from that, some of us. We don't realize we are one people. That's why, again, we have a Dawah brochure. You can get one across. It says, one, rel one God, same religion. Prophet Ab Ibrahim, alayhi salatu salam. Prophet Nuh, alayhi salatu salam. Prophet Musa, alayhi salatu salam. Prophet Isa, alayhi salatu salam. They worship one God, and it was the same message. Chapter 42, verse 13 says that. The same God, the same deen, the same way of life is what they all preached. But the question comes up in interfaith dialogues. Then why are you different? Why you are Christians, Jews, and Muslims separate? Well, that major separation really came around Jesus, peace be upon him, his birth, and whether he died or not. So Christian, Jews, and Muslims, there are major, major, major philosophical differences around that, his birth and his death. That's why as Muslims, we need to understand that. And we may be able to clarify a lot of doubts that people have. It's not a Christian thing or a Jewish thing. It's a Quranic thing. But, you know, we are so busy only making money. All of us, we're just busy making money. Dunya. That's why I always like to make the joke. We probably need another Trump. And many more Trumps. So he could wake the Muslims up. So they could pray more and read more Quran. And start giving more dawah. And start letting America know who or what is Islam. And who was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And who was Jesus, peace be upon him, in the Quran. And who was Moses, peace be upon him, in the Quran. And who was Ibrahim, peace be upon him, in the Quran. And who was Suleiman or Solomon, peace be upon him, in the Quran. We need to spread that message. But you see, until we don't get some challenge, we may not do it. We'll go to sleep and just... One business to the next, more money and more money, which is good. Business, money is the barakat, you know. As long as you pay your zakat and you give your sadaqah. Otherwise, it can be hell for us. Mm -hmm. Nobody says don't enjoy money. That's a bounty from Allah. Enjoy it. It's the third pillar of Islam. Spend it, use it. Don't abuse it. So time really doesn't permit me. I don't want to get into this topic. We did a lot in details. I really wanted to touch on a few reminders on Hajj and Umrah today, my brothers and sisters, and I really don't have much time. There's a five or ten minutes to do that in the second khutbah. But before we conclude the first khutbah, inshallah, just one point I wanted to remind myself and you again to connect with last week khutbah where the Prophet wasallam had all this persecution and oppression, loss of his uncle Abu Talib, his wife Khadija radiallahu ta'ala and her passed away. And then Allah opened the heavens for him and he went on this mirage, spiritual, physical, scientific journey. You see a little connection with Jesus, peace be upon him here. He was at a peak where they wanted to kill him. And you know when you talk of crucifixion, crucifixion was the form, the worst form of punishment that the government used to give at that time. You know when you hear in English, there's a, there's, there is a, 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 a statement that people normally use, and they say, I'll nail you to the cross. Have you ever heard that? Say, if you do that, and you really that, we will nail you to the cross, referring to crucifixion. Because nailing to the cross was one of the worst form of punishment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
when the people there in that time wanted to crucify Jesus, peace be upon him. What Allah did, right to the peak. Allah opened the heavens for him again, as Allah says in Surah Nisa, وَرَفَعَهُ And Allah raised him up. And that is Quranic also. So, back to you and I, when we have problems in life, when we have difficulties in life, and we go through, every one of us go through our own problems. But ponder over these lessons. The miraj of the Prophet wasallam, Allah raising Jesus, peace be upon him. At that real time of highest peak of persecution. So when we have problems and difficulties, don't just whine and whine like if the world has come to an end. Pray to Allah. Continue doing what you have to do for Allah. Ittaqullah, do your duty to Allah. And Allah will open many doors. Allah will open the doors of mercy for us. Allah will make things okay for us. These are sometimes trials to test us, to test us, to try us, to test our iman. And again, my brothers and sisters, we all have our own tests and trials to go through in our own ways. Your homes and our families, husbands, wives, businesses. We have problems in all different ways. But don't give up. Don't give up. As Muslims, we don't give up. We put our trust in Allah. So, in a few weeks, on the 27th of um, May, more or less, next month, should be the first day of fasting, more or less. And then after fasting, you have Hajj. So, I wanted to just remind myself and you in the second khutbah from now, because you know, the Prophet ﷺ has said, a time will come. When people would want to go to Hajj and they will not be able to. And this is almost like the time. You can't get visas. You know how many countries are already cut? They're not allowed visas anymore to go to Hajj. America, alhamdulillah, we still have a little bit of concession and flexibility here. But even America, they have started cutting very hard on the visa laws. So people got the money to go to Hajj and they can't go. They can't go. The other countries, they got the money. They don't have visas. They don't allow you to. That's why the Prophet ﷺ has said that when you have the ability to go to Hajj, the health and the means to go to Hajj, do it. Because you don't know. Don't procrastinate it. You don't know what may happen. You may fall sick. We may fall sick. Marid. We may have some sicknesses that we're not allowed to travel anymore. Or we may be healthy, but we may lose our money, and we may not have the means to go. So the Prophet ﷺ said, do not delay, don't procrastinate. You have the means and the wealth and the health to go to Hajj, go, hasten to it. Because Hajj is the fifth pillar of Islam. Hajj is as important as you pray your Jummah Salah. Brothers and sisters, Hajj is as important as we pray or five times Salah. Why don't we understand that? I don't understand why people don't understand that. Believe me, I can't understand that. We understand fast. Salah is important. Ramadan, fasting is important. But we don't understand Hajj is important. Hajj is a pillar. As important as Salah and Ramadan and Zakat. And that's why the Prophet wasallam says when you're blessed with the means... The health and the wealth, you don't have to wait to be a multi-billionaire, but the means to cover the expenses and your trip, do it. Because you may, we may not, we may have the money, we may be healthy, but we may have so many problems in our lives that we can't go to Hajj. So the Prophet says, go before. Do it. So I just wanted to remind myself and you, because you know, just after next month Ramadan begins, you go one more month again, boom, Shawal, Dhul and it's Hajj. And it's not like you got to do it. Long ago, you could have planned to go to Hajj one, a couple of weeks before. Now it doesn't work like that. Long ago, you could have gone to Hajj a week or two before. Just say, I'm ready to go to Hajj. Book your ticket, get your visa, and you go to Hajj. 
Now it doesn't work like that. It's a whole nine yards of procedure. Your name got to be sent to Saudi Arabia. It got to be approved. Your airline tickets got to be shown. Your hotel reservation got to be shown. And then in Saudi Arabia, they approve a barcode that you have been granted it. And then that is sent to so your embassy in America. And then they stick the visa. It ain't like you got a friend in the Saudi embassy. Say, hey, guy, just stick this for me. Long ago, you could have done that and performed Hajj. No, you can't. If you do that and you end up in Saudi, you might be pulled aside. Your passport will be thrown aside. And you will be wondering what has happened. Because they got a system. Just to go to Hajj takes a couple months now to start planning it professionally. Even if you plan, long ago people plan no hotel, no, no, no this, no that. Even no this or no that will mean no visa also. <laughs> it doesn't work like that anymore. See how it's getting difficult? What are we waiting for? Fifth pillar of Islam? And then no fault of the, the Saudis. Honestly, it's no fault of the Saudis. When you look into Hadith, you hear the Prophet وسلم, say, you hasten to perform because things may happen and you may not be able to. So these are some of the signs of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The prophecy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But again, as we said, a lot of us just procrastinate. So in the second khutbah, in the next five or ten minutes, I just want to remind myself and you a little bit of that. So you know, we can make our intentions, we can make our plans, and we can start working towards that, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us Jannah without reckoning, inshallah. Wa akhiri da'wan. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, in Ahmadahu, when a star in who, when a star of fear who, when not mino be he, when at the Wakalu Alay. When I will be lay him in Shururi and Fusena, women say ye at your Malina. May I had the Hilla who fell on the Lella, women you lil who fell a had the Allah. When I shed a la illa illa law who are the Hula Sharikala. وَنَشْهَدُ أَنَّا مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدَهُ وَرَسُولُهُ Once more we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing us to be here to perform the Salat al-Jumar and to listen to the khutbah and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his peace and blessings onto the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'een We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his mercy, his guidance, his forgiveness and his acceptance upon each and every one of us and again, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his mercy upon me by giving me the permission and the ability to continue with the second khutbah, inshallah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower unto me the quality of tawakkal ala Allah, the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the taqwa, the piety, the iman, the faith, the hikmah, the wisdom, the ilm, the knowledge, and the ability once more to continue with the second khutbah, inshallah. I put my tawakkal, I put my trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most sufficient. In the Holy Quran, and I'm going to just be cutting a little short here now in Surah Al-Imran, again, Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 97, hear what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنِ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا And it is our duty to Allah to perform the hajj if we have the ability to undertake the journey. That's very interesting. And I want to go to chapter 22, Surah Hajj. Surah Hajj, chapter 22, verse 28. Because, as I said, I don't have the time to break it up. Allah says here, when he speaks about وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجَّ When he speaks about call people Telling Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam that all nine yards, and you know, we have all these on CDs and different khutbahs for the years we have been doing by Idnullah, by the mercy of Allah. 
when he commanded Ibrahim to call the people Adhin Finas Bil Hajj. Call the people. Do you know it's a command from Allah? He commanded Ibrahim to call the people. Even though there were no people to call, he said, You call the people. Today we have one and a half billion. Don't you think it's more upon us to call the people? Yeah, because it's a command from Allah. Not only it's a duty to perform Hajj, but if you look at this order, wa adhin finnas bil Hajj, it becomes the duty of every Muslim to remind people and make the call to people to go to Hajj. We will get blessings for that. And when the people perform the Hajj, we get more blessings for that. And they don't lose their blessings. And then Allah continues in the verse to say, and they will come from far and wide, lame camel, good camels, could be everything, American Airlines, British Airways, you name it, Lufthansa, the whole world. They'll come walking and flying. And then Allah in the next verse, in the next verse, actually, in this verse 28, he said this before, Adhin Finnas in verse 27, Surah Hajj, he says, this is very interesting. And this is what I really wanted to just touch on in the next five minutes. One little piece of this. So that, call them to perform the hajj, to come for the hajj, so that they will be a witness. And Allah uses the word here. You know? Witness, so that they will testify and they will be able to see and they'll be able to witness the people who go to Hajj. Manafi alahum, the benefits that Allah has placed in Hajj for them. Allahu Akbar. Oh, yeah, go check it out. If you don't know this, go take the CD after Juma Khutbah, brothers and sisters. You see, a lot of us think, and that's just the one part, because you all know it's. Commanded to go to Hajj. A lot of people don't know that Hajj has a lot of benefits. A lot of us think that Hajj is only about fulfilling the pillar. But here is the verse. It's not my opinion. Allah is saying that when people go to Hajj, they will be able to testify and see the nafa, the benefits that Allah has placed in Hajj for them. Well, Allahu Akbar. My brothers and sisters, you know, one thing is to talk about Hajj is fifth pillar, Hajj is compulsory, you have the means to go. But Allah has placed so many benefits in Hajj that it's beyond the mind. Hajj opens up the understanding of a person spiritually, scientifically, psychologically, financially, morally, universally. There are so many different areas that Hajj opens up the understanding of a person that it's beyond understanding. Five and ten minutes, we can't talk about that. You see what we lose out on? A lot of us believe, okay, it's something I just got to get rid of before I die. That's, that's a garbage mentality. That's a jahiliya mentality. And I want to use that word. That's an ignorant mentality. Those were the days when people thought, Hajj, I got to do before I die. It's a pill I got to just fulfill. What stupidity is that? Where we got that from? Which hadith or Quran we got that from? All over in the Quran and hadith, it's about you have the means and ability, do it now. Where did we get that? I got to do it just before I die. Well, you should be praying salah just before you die too. Just pray, give zakat just before you die. Wait for the last year before you die and fast. Why don't you wait for the last year and then fast? Why don't you wait for the last year and then give zakat? Why don't we wait for the last year and then pray salah? But hajj is just as equal like salah, zakat, hajj, and fasting. Actually, in hajj, it's so compound that when you go to hajj, one of the benefits is you're able to strengthen your iman. You're able to pray salah around the Kaaba. Get a hundred times more blessings. The second pillar is even fulfilled. You're spending money, 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 money. You're not giving zakat, but you're still spending money from that third pillar of Islam, which will reduce your zakat. You don't claim for the money, you go to hajj. You just don't fast. Out of the five pillars, only the fasting don't come in. You got all the other four pillars combined into hajj benefits. Allahu Akbar. Look at the benefit. 
My brothers and sisters, the Prophet says, even for Umrah, when you go and do Umrah, one Umrah to the next Umrah, all the sins are forgiven in between. When a person goes for Hajj, when a person does Hajj and Umrah, you know what the Prophet says? That they are not only forgiven for their sins, but Allah removes poverty from their life. Could you imagine that? Allah opens your mind and puts barakat in our life. Allah enriches us. A lot of us today think if you go to Hajj, you get poorer. Just the opposite to what the Prophet ﷺ has seen. When you go to Hajj, you get richer. But you see, when our iman is weak, that's how we think. That we will lose. So we want to do it just before we die. So you say, Allah, you know, I did it. Be careful, Allah does, does ask you, why didn't you do it when you were supposed to do it? You know, it's like procrastinating your salah. If you have the means, we got to do it. Mm -hmm. There are so many, you know, when you go to Hajj, you are able, one of the barakat in Hajj, out of the many, Allah permits next week, we'll continue on that because I really can't continue today. We don't have the time. But just to remind myself and touch a little bit before we continue next week, you know, Allah brings to the understanding of a man or woman when they go to Hajj, that you may think you are the king of your house, you are the, the millionaire of your business, but when we go to Hajj, we realize that we are just a slave and a servant of Allah. Oh yeah. You spiritually realize that. And if you don't have the iman to spiritually realize that you're just a slave and servant of Allah, you think you're a king in your little house in Florida, or you think you're a little king in your gas station and convenience store or restaurant, Allah says you're nothing. Then you realize the millions of people who come to worship Allah, and then you're like, oh boy, if I don't worship Allah, then I have lost out. If I didn't come for Hajj, I lose, because there are millions who want to worship Allah. You're not doing Allah a favor. We don't do Allah a favor by performing Hajj. It's a favor unto us. Allah speaks of the nafa. We benefit in performing Hajj Umrah, my brothers and sisters. And if we don't have the iman again, the faith to understand that we are just a slave and just a servant of Allah, let me share something with you in a worldly point of view. Worldly point of view. When a millionaire goes to Hajj, he realizes he's also nobody. Because when he looks around, he sees multi-millionaires around him. I've seen that. I've been taking Hajj groups since 1986. Some of you probably were not born. 1986, I led the first Hajj group in my life. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. And I've been experiencing this. A guy thinks he's rich, only to realize the guy next to him could buy him and his whole family and all his businesses in America. You realize you're nothing. You meet the richest. You meet all level of people. So it brings us down. Don't even think about the wearing when everyone in their pure white and everybody normal and humble. You can't differentiate who is a Mercedes driver and a Lexus driver and a what driver. Because you're all on the same plane and the same ship together there. It helps us to understand hakikat. It helps us to understand what the day of judgment will be like. The reality of the day of judgment when everyone will line up equal, no race. When you go to Hajj, you realize everyone going around the Kaaba. It has nothing to do, this is Arab, this is Pakistani, this is Bangladeshi Masjid, this is Pakistani Masjid, this is Caribbean Masjid, a garbage. You could pull that garbage in America, Pakistani Masjid, Bangladeshi Masjid, and you don't do that in Hajj. Then there's no line around the Kaaba for Bangladeshis and Pakistanis and Arabs separated. It's everybody together. <laughs> We were taught in the Quran that this is one ummah, one ummah, and we worship Allah in oneness. You don't separate by nationality. So we also realize when we go to Hajj, and then anything about doctor's line and engineer's line and millionaire's line and nationality. Hajj brings a spiritual, moral understanding to us that helps to lift our iman, my brothers and sisters. So those of us, you know, we really lose out. Those of us who have the means and the ability, don't waste time. Listen, life is going too fast. Death just knocks. Just, death just knocks. 
Don't waste time. I, I urge you and myself, study some of the fadail and the benefits of hajj. You know, when you go to hajj, you become a guest of Allah. What you become? The guest of Allah. And what did the Prophet wasallam say about a guest of Allah? He says the guest of Allah. Allah honors the people who come to hajj, the guest. Because they are, they, you are his mehman. As you say in Urdu, he is our mezban and we are his mehman. He's the host and we are the guest. Because we go to this home and what do we say? Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Ya Allah, we are present. Allah says, you are my guest, the Prophet wasallam tells us. Allah treats us like a guest. The Prophet wasallam says when a person goes to hajj and he asks Allah for something, Allah gives it to him. Because how do you treat your guest? When a guest comes to your home, what do you do? If he asks for soda, you give him soda. He wants water, you give him water. He wants a cup of coffee, you give him. What you don't normally make for yourself, you will give your guest. Because you want to treat your guest the best. So Allah treats the guest the best. You make a dua, your forgiveness is automatic. Automatic. Just to make that effort to go there. You do your part. You don't break the commands of Allah. You forgive a newborn baby. What does a newborn baby mean? No sins. Why do you want to wait for the last year of your life to do that? How do we know which is the last year of our life? Do we know if it's today? You already see Trump sending all kind of bombs and missiles all over the place. You might be somewhere in a plane and boom, the missile hits you. No hajj anymore, brother. So what are we waiting on? Trump has to do his job. You got to do your job. We got to do our job. Do our duty to Allah. Pray to Allah. Fulfill the pillars of Islam. Do what we have to do. Don't worry about everything else. We can't fix the world. And you don't wait to fix the problems before we go to Hajj. Go to Hajj to Allah and ask Allah to fix your problems. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. I always tell you, I had an example. A brother came to me one day upstairs in the office. He said, Sheikh, I made intention to go to Hajj, but I'm not going again. I said, what's the problem? He said, my wife wants to get divorced. So I got to stay home and solve that problem. I said, think. Think. You go to Hajj and Allah will solve that problem. He went. Why forgot about the divorce? You can't fix the problem. It's Allah who fixes the problem. He thought he would have remained back and fixed the problem. I said, you go to Hajj. Tell the wife you're going to go to Hajj. When you come back, you will discuss divorce. He said, when he came back, Allah changed her mind. She became a better Muslim than him. From the member, I'm telling you that. Wallahi. She became a better Muslim than him. Live an example. And that money can't buy if you think it's money. And that's how Allah works, my brothers and sisters. So, you know, to conclude again, we, alhamdulillah, and you know, there's a hadith. I spoke about that a few weeks ago. You can get the khutbah on that where the Prophet wasallam said, if you do umrah in Ramadan, you get the blessings of hajj. So those of you who cannot afford hajj this year, but you can afford an umrah, which is about $2,700, $2,800, do it in Ramadan. Al-Hikmat, we have a group going in Ramadan. In the first 10 days, well, not the first 10 days, after the first week from the 4th of June to the 10th, in Ramadan, you do Umrah, you get the blessings of Hajj, says the Prophet And if you have the means to go to Hajj, well, then we go to Hajj as usual in, 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 uh, in the, the last week of, of October, um, August. We have a quick trip, a 14 days trip. If you want some more details, they got some flyers at the Al Hikmat Dawah table. You know, Adhin Finnas, it's a command by Allah to call the people to hajj. So it's a duty upon me and all of us to remind the people to go to hajj, and that's all. I can only do the call. The Prophet told Ibrahim, Allah told Ibrahim Islam, your mission is to make the call. You can't bring the people and you can't make the people. So my mission is to remind you and remind myself. We set up the system and the mechanism. Those of you who want to go to Umrah, you want to get a blessing, you want to hajj, we do the mission. It's you. Make the dua to Allah. You get the hidayah from Allah, inshallah. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman Rahmin, Ya Ghaffur Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Wa la aqibati lal muttaqeen. Wa salati wa salamu ala rasulihi wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman Rahmin, Ya Ghaffur Rahim. Allah, we thank thee for all the favors and bounties you have bestowed upon us, Ya Allah. We ask thee, Allah, to give us all the good in this world and the good in the hereafter, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask thee, Ya Allah, to save us from calamities and disasters and difficulties, Ya Allah. Allahumma rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa qina adhaabinaan. Bi rahmatika